Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Parham, host of AZ Illustrated Metro. Tonight we'll hear from two economists. First we'll ask what sequestration has meant for the nation's economy. Then we'll focus on Tucson's economic outlook. We'll check in with a group trying to take the partisanship out of politics and ask about the progress of a committee seeking to incorporate bail. But first, a look at today's top stories. The justices on the United States Supreme Court this morning heard arguments on Arizona's voter registration law. In 2004, Arizona voters passed Prop 200, requiring anyone registering to vote to provide a birth certificate, passport, or other proof of U.S. citizenship. Federal law does not require proof of citizenship. Instead, voters sign an affidavit affirming they are citizens. The groups trying to get Arizona's law thrown out say the state's paper proof keeps minorities from registering to vote. Arizona Attorney General Tom Horn argued for the state. And I think it was wrong for the Ninth Circuit to say that the citizens of Arizona are prohibited from doing what is necessary to verify that someone is a citizen. Attorney General Horn also says the U.S. Justice Department approved the law. The court will decide the case before this summer. Pima Community College has 10 days to respond to its accrediting agency, which wants to put the college on probation. The Higher Learning Commission began an investigation at PCC in January following a series of complaints. In a 30-page report, the commission cited serious concerns about the way PCC is managed. The report says the college lacks integrity when awarding large contracts and needs more financial accountability. If PCC is put on probation, it will have two years to fix the problems. And the Arizona Senate today gave final approval to a bill allowing certain teachers and administrators to carry guns in rural schools. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Automatic federal spending cuts, known as sequestration, are in their third week. Yet it seems the nation's economic performance is so far unfazed. Michael Chihok spoke with the chief economist of Northern Trust Bank for an assessment. Carl Tannenbaum, chief economist of Northern Trust Bank, thanks for speaking with me. Oh, it's good to be with you today. Two weeks into the sequestration of the federal budget, how are we doing? Relatively little. The bite of the sequestration will probably only begin presenting itself over the next couple of months or so. And in the meantime, both the financial markets and businesses seem to be working past it. We've had very strong equity markets, and surveys of business people are indicating that they're moving ahead without waiting for Congress to reach any kind of resolution. Are we seeing anything positive come out of it? Some have pointed out, for all of its clumsiness, the sequestration is, in fact, a credible way of getting our deficit under control. This will be the fifth straight year that our deficit will be lower than the year before, which represents the sort of progress that people are asking for when they want to get government burden out of the business cycle. And you mentioned the stock market, and it seems unfazed by uh, sequestration. In fact, it's at record levels. What accounts for that? The stock market's been performing well because prospects for economic growth seem to be getting better and better. Readings that we've gotten on hiring, on manufacturing, and on housing are all very encouraging. And I'd point out that the stock market is usually a great leading indicator of future economic activity. The wealth created in the stock market gives people the wherewithal and confidence to spend a little bit more, and that wealth effect is one of the things that's helping us overcome the sequestration. Businesses continue to cite uncertainty as a reason they don't hire and don't expand, yet uncertainty is an area in which uh, risk occurs and growth can occur. Businesses are known for taking risks. How do you explain that dichotomy in thinking? Consumers and businesses are notorious for saying one thing in response to surveys and then doing another. In this case, I get the sense that all of us are quite frustrated that the Congress can't figure out some of the long-term challenges that will affect businesses and consumers over the long term. But in the short term, businesses are seeing opportunities to grow, and so while frustrated with Congress, they aren't waiting for them to reach a resolution. Will government uh, layoffs, if they come under sequestration, have an impact on the overall economy and the GDP? Our projections suggest that the sequester, the automatic spending cuts, will probably reduce our rate of economic growth this year by about 
half of a percent, which is a reasonable amount. In addition, there are projections that it will cost some 500,000 or 600,000 jobs between now and the end of 2013. So that's also non-negligible. But it seems that private sector activity is accelerating at a pace to offset some or all of that. Is it a result of what's going on with shrinking government, or is it a coincidence? It's probably more of a coincidence. I don't think that the deficit reduction that the sequester is bringing us has been the impetus for a release of business energy. Nonetheless, I think the frustration that many of us had with Congress as we went into the fiscal cliff at the end of the year has been replaced by something a little less threatening, and therefore investors and business people are moving forward. The housing market seems to be on a bit of a rebound after several very slow years during the recession. Are we going to see that continue and expand? Housing has clearly come past the bottom, but it faces a long road ahead. As my dad once told me, if you're in a deep hole and you come out of it by 5%, you're still in a deep hole. And the limitations on housing remain that mortgage finance is very different than it was during the heyday of the housing boom. It's tougher to get a mortgage, and people are therefore having to save up for a down payment, and it takes a lot longer than it used to. And you were mentioning before we came on camera that the dynamic of who's buying houses has changed as a result of some of the financial aspects. Talk about that a little bit. Well, among the bigger sources of demand for single-family housing has been coming from investors who are buying blocks of houses and then turning them back out for rental, which is really the choice of dwelling that many Americans are re re rediscovering after trying to get into houses uh, headlong over the last 20 years or so. Arizona succumbed to the housing bubble in a greater way than a lot of states because of our great population growth and expansion in housing. Do you see that stabilizing in the state? Absolutely. In markets like Phoenix and Tucson, where you have had a lot of vacancy and a lot of foreclosure, this is actually a very productive renewal process for housing and at least getting residents in there so that the value of the property holds up a little bit better and hopefully they'll have the opportunity to save and become homeowners down the road. So what we see happening in Arizona is that the housing market is being shored up by investors largely? Its investor activity and also the Federal Reserve in keeping mortgage rates low has made financing for those investors more attractive to get. Again, you have to take a few steps before you get back on your normal path, and this seems to be a very productive start. How do we avoid getting back into that cycle of the housing bubble or uh, any other asset bubble and thus the fear that we'll go into another downturn at some point in the future? The memory of the housing crash is still very fresh in the minds of both prospective homeowners and borrowers and policymakers and, and banks. The sobriety that that has bred is not soon going to be lost. In fact, it's been institutionalized by some new regulations, which should really help mortgage lending go forward on a much more stable basis. Carl Tannenbaum, Chief Economist for Northern Trust Bank. Thanks for speaking with us. It's great to be with you. Now we'll continue our focus on the economy. Indicators like unemployment figures, reports about hiring trends, and economic forecasts have just come out. Joining us in the studio now is George Hammond, the Associate Director of the Economic and Business Research Center at the U of A. George, thanks so much for being here today and welcome. Um, Arizona's January unemployment rate has gone up a little bit, as we've just heard last week. Can you talk to us about why that is and put it in perspective for us? Well, occasionally unemployment rates do bounce up a little bit in January. It's primarily driven by seasonal factors. Mm -hmm. um, so one For thing example, on the seasonal factors. In terms of what a seasonal factor, a seasonal um, sort of influence would be the fact that uh, retailers tend to staff up significantly for the holidays in December and then they will shed some workers as they go into January. So that's a, one example of, of a seasonal influence that might drive an unemployment rate up. You know, overall, Arizona's unemployment rate is down significantly from a year ago. We were at 8.6% seasonally adjusted last year this time. We're now down to 8%, uh, just a little bit above the national rate. So overall, uh, Arizona's labor market is improving. Uh, unemployment rates down six tenths of a percent. And that improvement was primarily driven by job growth. 
you know, one of the factors that in some cases does drive an unemployment rate down is individuals dropping out of the labor market. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't a major factor over the past year. It was really job growth and improvements in Arizona's labor market that drove the decline in the unemployment rate. So can you give us some examples of areas where jobs have grown? Are there some specific industries or segments that are really taking off now? Sure. Over the past year, Arizona has generated significant job gains in construction uh, with the rebound in the housing market. Uh, we've also seen significant job growth in the service providing sectors. For example, leisure and hospitality like uh, restaurants and bars is up significantly over the past year. We've also seen job growth in healthcare as well as financial activities and even professional and business services, which is a a varied sector that includes um, you know, accountants, engin engineers, management consultants, and really a wide variety of jobs. But one of the striking things about the job growth over the past year is that it's uh, well balanced for the state economy. It's not just one sector driving growth. And I'm sure that's important, but in Southern Arizona, we're always concerned about the state picture versus what's really happening here. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. The uh, uh, unemployment rate in uh, Tucson is down significantly from a year ago. Um, although the growth there uh, hasn't been accompanied by the same sort of labor force growth that we've seen for the state. Uh, in addition, while we've seen job growth in the Tucson economy over the past year, it's uh, about half the state growth rate uh, and even a bit below the national growth rate over the past year. So Tucson is growing. It is adding jobs. But that uh, job growth is coming at a somewhat slower rate than nationally and particularly compared to Phoenix. But I just saw a study or a survey that said Tucson was in the top 25 percent of just a handful of cities in the country. Uh, not the top 25 percent, but 25 percent of our employers saying they're going to add jobs in the first, second quarter of the year. Um, that sounds like a really encouraging sign and good news. Uh, we are seeing encouraging signs in the Tucson economy. Uh, job growth was essentially flat in 2011, it was about six tenths of a percent in 2012, and we think that that job growth will continue to accelerate in 2013. And the uh, manpower study uh, suggests that uh, you know employers are uh, seeing the same sort of picture of accelerating growth in the Tucson economy as we go into 2013. So I think that uh, Southern Arizona is going to continue to accelerate. And as part of that survey, it said that only 5% were saying that they were actually going to reduce their workforce, um, because that's an important part of it, too. Absolutely. You know, the, the, what we're thinking about typically is net job growth. And that's the difference between you know, firms that are adding jobs versus firms that are shedding jobs. So what we tend to focus on is that net. But in any quarter, in any month, there are firms that are adding jobs and firms that are shedding jobs. But it's the net number that actually gets published and that we all wind up talking about. So there's so many of these studies and numbers and reports coming out. Which one should we as consumers really pay attention to? Well, we tend to pay uh, a lot of attention to the, um, to the data that's released um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Arizona Office of Employment and Population Statistics. Uh, that is uh, uh, high quality data that gives us really a fairly complete picture of what's going on in Arizona's labor market and the Southern Arizona labor market. Good. Well, now, um, as, as we look forward, though, I mean, this is your business, is looking at the big right. picture. Uh, talk about Arizona and Southern Arizona in particular as far as really going forward. We know where we are now, but where are we going for the rest of the year and even beyond that? I think we're headed upward, and I think the growth has a good chance of accelerating uh, over the next year in the Southern Arizona economy and for Arizona uh, as a whole. Now, one key element of that forecast is the housing market. So we've been uh, kind of waiting for housing and construction activity to really rebound, and it seems like that is starting to catch fire. Uh, and we think that over the next couple of years, that will really generate significant job growth. George, thanks so much for being here today. Great. Thank you.
Supreme Court justices weighed a challenge to an Arizona law requiring proof of citizenship for voter registration. We talked to Marsha Coyle about today's court arguments and asked about the broader implications for other immigration laws. Then we turned to the banking crisis in Cyprus as European Union leaders called for a tax on savings accounts, prompting a drop in global stocks. Jeffrey Brown kicks off a week of stories about the Middle East, starting with Israel's new governing coalition sworn into office today. Paul Salman reports on older workers and academic institutions, professors in the classroom long past age 65. And we examine the Republican National Committee's call for a new direction for the GOP, a roadmap hoping for a rebound in 2016 and beyond. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. When writer Amy Stewart has a cocktail, she sees a garden in her glass. Take, for instance, a Manhattan. You can start with a whiskey, which would contain barley, rye, and wheat or corn. And then you add sweet vermouth, so there's your grapes. And then the final ingredient in a Manhattan is, of course, a cherry. I'm Renee Montaigne, the drunken botanist, on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. A group that calls itself No Labels is trying to take the partisanship out of politics. The national group and local chapters formed because members wanted to get people talking about political issues without the partisanship and opposition that typically frames such discussions. Andrea Kelly sought to find out what the local chapter of No Labels is doing now. Dorothy Riley, I've been with No Labels for the two years that it started. I became involved um, from a newspaper article that was in the paper uh, several years ago in interviewing Bunny Davis, and she was the original pioneer uh, of uh, No Labels in Tucson. And as I read about it, I thought, yeah, that's a group that I really uh, want to be a part of because they're trying to get government work more effectively for all, uh, for all of us. Organizers of Tucson's No Labels group hadn't held a meeting in about a year, and Dorothy Riley is trying to activate the group of people who say they want to take some of the partisanship out of politics. John Ragsdale is also a member. It's an organization, uh, kind of a grassroots organization, whose purpose is to get away from the, the boundaries that are identified by using a label, such as a being a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent and bring together with some common causes to make the government function more effectively than it currently is. Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians, unaffiliated uh, can get together <laughs> and, and work on similar issues even though some of our politics might be different. So uh, hopefully we can set an example to our Congress and uh, show them that, yeah, it can be done. Yeah, if one's really trying to work on it. The meeting attendance is sparse, and increasing it is one of Riley's goals. However, the group's size isn't going to prevent her from working on changing politics. The first slide that I put there is a famous quotation from Margaret Mead, a noted anthropologist, and I've always loved it. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has. No Labels is a national organization with chapters in all 50 states. Riley says there are about 300,000 national members and 3,300 members in Arizona, though she thinks most of those are what's called digital members, people who join online and sign petitions but aren't attending meetings. The name No Labels uh, came about has um, really symbolism that uh, we, we don't want to use labels. Once you attach a label to somebody, it can conjure up a lot of different ideas. My daughter is a teacher, I, I taught also, you know, and sometimes you hear things about students and that can bias you and prejudice you. Same thing if you hear conservative, progressive, liberal, um, you know, a Democrat. There's certain things that conjure up in your mind about this individual before even actually listening to them. And that creates barriers. And I, I think we see a lot of those barriers. One way No Labels is hoping to cut through some of those barriers is getting members of Congress to agree to meet regularly with people from other parties. There are 53 representatives and senators who have agreed to that goal, but none from Arizona. Riley is asking local No Labels members to try to get Democratic Representative Ron Barber and Republican Senator Jeff Flake to join that list. Ragsdale says he has an even higher goal. Number one, I would hope to see 
all of the members of Congress eventually become involved with No Labels and become part of the Problem Solvers Initiative that No Labels is pushing. It seems to me to be a, just a, almost a no-brainer that, uh, that every member of Congress uh, should join in and uh, help to make the government function through the Problem Solvers process. That goal, like others in politics, is a work in progress. Nationally, No Labels has been involved in other efforts in Congress, including a proposal to dock pay for members when they don't get their jobs done. But so far in the accomplishments, and this is a big one, the No Budget, No Pay, um, that was started just about a year ago. And the proposal is basically that if a, a budget is not established with appropriations by the designated deadline, then um, they do not receive their pay. Uh, Riley says no labels is also pushing filibuster reform in an effort to cut down on the number of times one party or the other can prevent a vote on legislation. Ragsdale says aside from political goals to make government more efficient and effective, the group is simply trying to get elected officials to communicate with each other in a non-political way. Get together and have a dinner occasionally. I mean, they, they laugh about uh, some of the uh, some of the people going bowling, but you know, it's it's that old thing. If you touch a person's hand, look in their eye, you you create a connection, and they're one label, you're another label. And if you can if you can break down those those kind of uh, barriers, those labels that have been put on people, then. Uh, uh, hopefully we can get something done. I guess that's probably the best thing I can say is that hopefully we can get something done. The Tucson mayor is urging unincorporated areas of Pima County to join an existing city or town or form their own governments. One group of people who live in the southeast suburb of Vail are working on a plan to incorporate. Joining us in the studio today are Tucson Mayor Jonathan Rothschild and Scott Altair of the Citizens for Vail Committee. Welcome to both of you and thanks for being here today. Mayor, you talked about in your State of the City address just a few weeks ago about the importance of annexation and then also talk some about incorporation. Can you explain your overall philosophy for us? Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, Maria. Um, the state uh, collects and shares revenue back to the cities and counties based on a formula that says how many people live in incorporated areas. Pima County has 335,000 residents living in unincorporated areas, one of the largest in the United States. For each resident, you get $300 per person who is in a, in a city. So to me, $110 million, and there's costs that are associated with it, but $110 million of revenue that can go either to provide more services or perhaps to cut some of our taxes just makes sense, and, and we, when we struggle economically in this region sometimes, this is a way that the state has told us, this is a way to be prosperous. And I think the Vail example uh, is, is a model for what can work. And so Scott, you're trying to form this new government and, and Vail. Can you tell us what some of the advantages are and why the people there want to do it? I think the second what the mayor said, the, we're losing revenue to um, to the state of Arizona. We want to capture that revenue and be able to set our priorities. We feel there's a sense of community um, that already exists out there. We feel that um, that un uncaptured revenue could be spent um, by the, the community of Vail for things that matter the most to them. And, and primarily, um, uh, the advantages is being able to dictate where that money goes, whether it's roads, parks, um, and or just better uh, police protection. So, Mayor, why why are you encouraging Vail to incorporate? Though you and the City Council both have adopted a resolution saying, "Hey, we're all for this." So, why are you um, in favor of that rather than just them annexing themselves into Tucson? Are you annexing? Well, them? I think they've done some work in Vail, and I think what Scott said is right. Uh, there is a sense of community out there. Uh, they have indicated that as a, a group that they would like to be their own community. And I think it's time we honor things like that. You know, Vail has indicated that 
uh, their state shared revenue would be about $3.1 million right now without a sales tax, without anything. And they indicate that they can provide all the services they need for state shared revenue, which is money that we are already being taxed on and paying for those services. It is just an economic infusion to our area and allows a community to create its own uh, sense of what it's going to be. Well, but Scott, I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion in your community about which of these is best, annexation or incorporation. Um, why did you choose incorporation over annexation where the money would come in and you would be part of the city? Well, we studied about five different forms of gover governance um, and we arrived at incorporation, but we did look at annexation. Um, uh, primarily, I think incorporation is um, Again, the sense of community, um, we feel that we have um, ideals um, that are unique. Um, we have certain things that bind us together out there. We Can you we, tell us what some of those are, sure. what's unique about the community and what well, is binding you together? A lot of the community is spawned from the Vail School District. We were recognized as one of the um, premier school districts in the country, both by Bloomberg Weekly and by Family Circle Magazine. Uh, we also are recognized by the state as uh, one of the top um, uh, school districts. Um, I think that's where a lot of it starts, but we have a, a history and a culture out there. Um, dating back to 1893 when we were christened in town, uh, the christening was not a, a formal nature, but uh, we still we have uh, a lot of the homesteaders that live out in that area. We, uh, we just believe that um, we, we are our own community and that we think we can set the priorities for, for the area better than perhaps, you know, a government that is, is further away. And, and Mayor, I know that um, you're for the uh, incorporation, but are there advantages as far as the city's concerned if the area did choose to be annexed in, instead? Is there some growth potential for Tucson that's good for everybody? Well, in a lot of ways, it's a six of one, half dozen the other to the city. If this incorporation effort fails, we will be happy to come out and talk to people as we're going around the city, talking about the advantages of being in the city, the excellent police services we provide, uh, the fire services that come within your uh, already existing taxes, uh, the water, and, and in Vail, um, a lot of the city already gets city water. I'm not sure that is not the case in Vail, which is another reason for them to be separate. But uh, we're happy to talk to them about it either way. To me, it is just the simple matter of let's get our tax dollars back to Tucson and use them for Tucson, not l let them go up to Phoenix and be used in Scottsdale or Paradise Valley. So as we close tonight, Scott, what's next? Well, we're in full swing of petition signature gathering right now. Uh, as, as of March 6th, we filed with the elections office and we have 180 days to collect signatures. And uh, we have um, March 23rd and March 30th at the Walgreens and Vail, we'll be setting up to collect signatures and continuing our public outreach. How, ma how many signatures do you need? We believe we're going to need anywhere from 300 to 400, and we will, we will make that a definite number here at the end of the month when we meet with the county recorder's office. Well, thank you both for being here. Thanks, Marie. Thank you for having us. To post a comment about any of today's stories or keep up with the latest news, go online to our website, azpm.org. I'm Maria Parham. Thanks for watching.